why did the North invade the South in 1861? Was it because they hated slavery? No, it was to save the Union. Checkmate, Lincolnites! <laughs> The program where we pulverize the outrageous slander so often leveled upon us by carpet bag and taps who seek to besmirch the reputation of our great and glorious country, the Confederate States of America. Tonight, we examine the pettifoggery, hypocrisy, and tyranny of our northern brethren, the meddling Yankee. Oh, I'm sorry, did you say something just before? I simply could not hear you over the sweet sound of victory. Okay, let's not get ahead of ourselves here. Just because abolition wasn't a primary northern war aim doesn't change the fact that the South unequivocally seceded to preserve slavery. South Carolina, for example. South Carolina seeked succession from the Union first for reasons that are debated upon. Slavery. Debated upon? What was Lincoln's reaction? Violated constitutional law and did multiple acts of war against a state that by law should have been able to succession from the Union. In response to the actions of the president, which was tyrannical, Dude, South Carolina seceded before Lincoln was even inaugurated. Jefferson Davis was sworn in as president a full six days before Lincoln was. In any event, slavery was never at the forefront of the Union reason for fighting. Most southern states and generals joined the CSA after Lincoln, without approval from Congress, raised an army of 75k to invade the South. Which he did on April 15th, 1861, right after the attack on Fort Sumter. And in so doing, he alienated the four states that were still holding out for a compromise in the spring of 61. The North was the only party calling for troops. As Virginia Governor Fletcher said, You have chosen to inaugurate civil war. The southern states never had any intention of invading the north. We didn't need to. Hmm. Do you know what the seceded states were up to for the four months before Fort Sumter? Chilling. Yearning for freedom from Yankee tyranny. Well, not quite. January 4th, 1861. Anticipating Alabama's immediate secession, Governor A.B. Moore ordered the state militia to seize federal property at Mount Vernon Arsenal, Fort Morgan, and Fort Gaines, effectively putting Mobile Bay in Confederate control. January 6th, a group of armed men barged into the federal arsenal at Apalachicola, Florida, and demanded the keys to the armor. January 10th, weeks before Louisiana's secession, state militia seized the U.S. arsenal at Baton Rouge on orders from the governor. The following day, they seized Forts Jackson and St. Philip, which guarded the mouth of the Mississippi. January 13th, armed Mississippians took forcible control of the unfinished federal fort on Ship Island in the Gulf. January 24th, Georgia militia seized the Augusta Arsenal. February 8th, acting on orders from the governor, Arkansas militia volunteers seized the federal arsenal at Little Rock and escorted federal troops across March lines. March 6th, the Provisional Confederate Congress authorized President Davis to raise an army of 100,000 men for 12 months service. April 12th, South Carolina militia fired on Fort Sumter. April 15th, President Lincoln called for 75,000 volunteers for three months service to suppress the rebellion. Call me crazy, but but all I see is southern aggression. You yellow-bellied horse thief! We raided those armories and forts because we needed weapons, and plenty of them, to facilitate our peaceful and equitable separation from the Union. Good thing we did, too, for soon after the war started, the tyrant Lincoln showed his true colors. He suspended habeas corpus illegally and jailed his political enemies without any charges. What do you call that except despotism of the highest order? I call that pretty typical for a 19th century wartime government. Personally, I agree with you. Suspending habeas corpus during domestic emergencies is a very, very slippery slope, but it is constitutional. Article 1, Section 9 forbids the suspension of habeas corpus except in cases of invasion or rebellion. But in 1861, Supreme Court Chief Justice Roger Taney challenged Lincoln on that exact point arguing that the legislature alone had that power, as the framers of the Constitution clearly implied, and not the president. That's true, but initially Lincoln only suspended habeas corpus along rail lines leading to Washington, D.C., and as he pointed out in his public response to Taney, he did it to make sure that those rail lines were kept intact. Without them, Congress wouldn't be able to physically get to D.C. to convene, and by the way, when he did suspend habeas corpus for the whole country in 1863, he did it with full congressional approval. Oh, that is just so typical of you bootlicking Yankees. 
You have no appreciation for personal freedom. I bet you'd vote for Palpatine. We Confederates, on the other hand, know the meaning of liberty. Yeah, uh, about that. The restriction of civil liberties in the Confederate states was actually way worse than it ever was up north. The Confederate Congress also suspended habeas corpus. Twice. They passed the Alien Enemies Act, which allowed the government to arrest anyone who didn't declare themselves as a loyal citizen of the Confederacy. They passed the Sequestration Act, which allowed the government to seize oh, private crap. property. They forbade civilian travel, prohibited the sale of liquor, and most famously instituted an extremely unpopular conscription act, the first such draft in American history. Again, all pretty typical actions for a wartime government, but you don't really have a leg to stand on when you prop up the Confederacy as this shining beacon of freedom, especially when you take into account the tyranny that's inherent in the institution of slavery. Slavery, slavery, slavery. Always you with the slavery. Well, you'll be just devastated to learn that your Lord and Savior Lincoln didn't give a damn about slavery and said so. And I quote, my paramount object in this struggle is to save the Union. If I could save the Union by not freeing any slave, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing all the slaves, I would do that. And if I could save it by freeing some and leaving others in bondage, I would also do that. What I do about slavery and the colored race, I do because I believe it helps to save the Union. Ah yes, the quote from the Greeley letter. Trouble is, you've taken it completely out of context. Lincoln wrote that as a public response to an editorial in the New York Tribune that criticized him for not taking more decisive action against slavery. It's worth noting that when Lincoln wrote that response, he actually had a draft of the Emancipation Proclamation already written and was just waiting for an opportunity to put it into effect. And of course he emphasized saving the Union. Most of the North was intensely racist during the Civil War, and as president, Lincoln had to placate both white supremacists and ardent abolitionists. That was Lincoln's constant struggle throughout his presidency. The purpose of that letter was to soften public opinion. Lincoln was emphasizing that he would put the immediate needs of the nation over his own personal preferences, and his preference was ending slavery for good. I notice you didn't include the concluding remarks that Lincoln made in that same letter. I have here stated my purpose according to my view of official duty, and I intend no modification of my oft-expressed personal wish that all men everywhere could be free." Though Lincoln personally abhorred slavery, he initially refused to infringe on slaveholders' constitutionally guaranteed property rights. Ending slavery was not his top or most immediate priority during the war, but it was a priority. In 1862, he repeatedly reached out to the border states to try to get them to favor compensated emancipation. And lest we forget, it was Lincoln's staunch opposition to expansion of slavery of any kind into the territories that caused the secession crisis in the first place. So your master may not have been pro-slavery per se, but he was still a filthy racist. As he once said, I, as much as any other man, am in favor of having the superior position assigned to the white race." Yes, he said that in the fourth debate with Stephen Douglas on September 18, 1858. Remember, every 19th century politician had to contend with a voting base made up largely of white supremacists. Lincoln was trying to quell some potentially catastrophic rumors that he was in favor of amalgamation or the mixing of the races. If it got out that he was in favor of equal rights, he wouldn't get elected to anything in America. But you have no real evidence confirming he believed anything different. You're right, but it's kind of ironic. You have to admit that you Confederates, who are normally so suspicious of Lincoln and of the federal government, are just willing to take the president's word on this. I wish you'd just shut up. It's like you just dredge up these quotes without taking even a little bit of time to research or comprehend their contexts. Both are clear examples of political grandstanding. Politicians lie. They exaggerate. They try to appeal to as many people as possible. Progressive politicians in particular lie about how committed they are to progressive ideas all the time. I believe that marriage is between a man and a woman. I do not support uh, gay marriage, but I support a very strong version of civil unions. This ruling will strengthen all of our communities by offering to all loving same-sex couples the dignity of marriage across this great land. Just because Obama lied about the gays does not mean that Lincoln lied about the blacks. Fair enough. 
You know, many free staters wanted their territories to be whites only havens. Oops, not supposed to talk about that. Yes, and speaking of Lincoln, throughout much of his political career, he was in favor of colonization, which would have entailed freeing American slaves and then sending them off to a colony in Africa. Which, uh, yeah, yeesh. It was a proposed solution to the main argument against abolition at the time, which was that it would be impossible to integrate blacks into American society. And that's horrifying. But? But, at the time, that was a very anti-slavery position. Now, we can argue about whether to judge Lincoln by the standards of racism in the 19th century or the standards of racism today, but the fact that he consistently fought against slavery is beyond dispute. So what if he did? It doesn't change the fact that after the Emancipation Proclamation made freeing the slaves a war aim, average Yankee soldiers deserted in the thousands. And that forced the United States to pass a conscription act of their own, which famously led to the New York City draft riots, one of the ugliest episodes in Civil War history. But focusing purely on the undeniable white supremacy of Northerners during the war diminishes the significance of the sizable minority of abolitionists in the North. Now, it's important to differentiate here between an anti-slavery position and an abolitionist one. Most Northerners before the war were anti-slavery, but they either wanted to contain it and allow it to go extinct on its own, or they wanted to gradually free the slaves with compensation to slave owners. Abolitionists took it a step further. They wanted to see the immediate, unconditional emancipation of all black Americans. New England was the hotbed of abolition at the time, and was home to its most famous and influential advocates. When John Brown's raid failed in 1859, most Northerners viewed him as a lunatic, a total psycho. But abolitionists like Henry David Thoreau successfully changed public opinion, and pretty soon Brown was being regarded as a martyr and a hero. It's in the song, right? John Brown's body lies moldering in the grave. John really Brown's don't have to body give us a lies moldering in the grave. John Brown's body lies moldering I in the grave. But his soul goes him. marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Shut up. Glory, 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 hallelujah. Stop it, man. No. Glory, oh, glory, oh, hallelujah. And his Shut soul up. goes marching on. And by the end of the war, many Union soldiers did consider their cause to be abolitionist. This was mainly because of the large number of contraband slaves that would follow Union armies wherever they went. And these Yankee boys, many of whom had never been to the South in their lives, were being confronted by the horrifying realities of slavery for the very first time. This hardened their hearts against that institution, and they said as much in their diaries and letters. Higher up, the logistical problems caused by this large number of escaped slaves forced commanders and politicians to take the idea of immediate abolitionism more seriously. So by mid-war, freeing the slaves wasn't just a moral imperative, it was also a practical necessity. Well, you Yankees are just uncultured and basically miserable. That's the main difference between us. As our glorious president, Jefferson Davis, once said in a speech at the Mississippi State Capitol, Our enemies are a traditionless and a homeless race. From the time of Cromwell to the present moment, they have been disturbers of the peace of the world. Gathered together by Cromwell from the bogs and fens of the north of Ireland and of England, they commenced by disturbing the peace of their own country. They disturbed Holland, to which they fled, and they disturbed England upon their return. They persecuted Catholics in England, and they hung Quakers and witches in America. And clearly... The apple does not fall far from the tree. <laughs> oh, f Ah! Ah! Oh! Thou art an unlearned swine, if thou dost truly believe that papists, Quakers, and witches ought to be shown mercy. But religious freedom is one of the founding principles- Oh! Ah! The oh. devil's tongue wags in thy mouth. Those who love the lords must needs separate themselves entirely from the professors of Ethan faiths. You know. That's not a bad point. Mixed communities are a disaster. Usually it's just one community getting to the top anyway. Communities are better kept separate, or at least totally homogenous. Oh, to so that way they can preserve their race, identity, and culture. If you ever noticed, mixed communities look just like New York City and have no identity. 
bastardizing. Anything in your neck? Devil Ram! My god. I have returned, lad. You have brought me to the Valley of Isian, where I live in the depths but see any ice. Hemmed in by mountains of sin, I be all dear glory. You have no power here, which finds a treasure. <laughs> <laughs> Draw the oak Satan as poison is drawn from a wand. If I go, Johnny Rip dies. Thou hast not killed me. Thou shalt not kill him. The south is mine. <laughs> My work here is done. Okay, uh, what happened? Hey man, are you, are you okay? You fucking stupid to compare a Nazi to a confederate. That's Yankee propaganda teaching you more lies. Good to have you back, buddy. Southerns treated African American maybe better in some cases. I know they were bad treated, but you think U.S. Grant treated them better them days. LMAO. Oh.